our third part of our imperialism lecture. Today we're going to talk about mostly Africa and imperialism, and then we're going to end up with a slide on immigration worldwide. So let's start with Africa. So in, if we go back to the start of the time period, so we go back to 1750, the map below you see is Africa, and everything in gray is controlled by Africans, and everything in some kind of other color is controlled by Europeans mostly. And if you notice that the Europeans at the start of the time period are just on the coast, most of Africa is still controlled by Africans. Now, the Europeans have been interested in Africa for a long time, and if we remember from 1450 to 1750, it was primarily because of the slave trade, and that's why they were on the coast. Or if you recall, Europeans would show up on the coast, they would uh, trade with uh, coastal African tribes who would then go inland and get Africans and bring them back to the coast and return for guns and finished products and those kinds of things. Um, but the Europeans really didn't go inland in Africa. Um, and it was because of several factors. One was malaria. Malaria is um, a disease that is transferred by mosquitoes in the blood, and the Europeans had no defense to this. And so Europeans didn't want to go into Africa because they would most likely die from malaria. And so that was one thing keeping the Europeans out. Another thing is that Africa is really, as a continent, it sets up on a high plateau, the continent. And when you get close to the coastland, that plateau drops off before you get to the coast. And so there's this big cliff there around Africa. And so the, when, uh, if you wanted to sail, try to sail into Africa, up one of the major rivers of Africa, you really couldn't do it because you'd go about, oh, half a mile to a mile inland and you'd reach a series of waterfalls from that plateau kind of dropping off. And the Europeans really had no way of getting inside of Africa because you can't sell up waterfalls. Um, and so we see that Africa is known as the Dark Continent because the inside of it was unknown to white people. Um, and so we really didn't see lots of colonization going on in Africa um, in 1450 to 1750. However, if we look at this next map, we see that Africa, by the 1900, the end of this time period, Africa is completely colonized. There's only two places that aren't, and we'll talk about that later, but everything on this map that you see is in a color besides yellow, that is mostly going to be European control. And so Europe, in, in just from 1750 to 1900, is going to completely change the face of Africa, and they're going to come in and take it over. We call, we call this the scramble for Africa. Um, basically the 19th century Europeans going in and carving up Africa. So what's going to allow the Europeans to go from hardly any control of Africa to controlling the whole continent? Um, well, partly it's because the Europeans want to get into Africa um, for raw materials. Now, in the last time period, they wanted slaves, but in this time period, a little contextualization, since Europe is industrialized, they want raw materials for their factories, and Africa has a lot of minerals. Um, another thing they want is markets, of course. African people, they could force, if they colonize them, they could force the African people to buy their goods. And so industrialization is one of the reasons, just like we see everywhere, where Europeans are going to try to get into Africa. Next, what we see is there's going to be a new medicine developed. It's called quinine. Quinine comes from a tree in South America. And once the Europeans figure out that you can use quinine as a treatment to, uh, for malaria, um, now there's not really a disease that's keeping them from getting into Africa. And so this is another thing that allows the Europeans to enter into Africa. One, they, they have a desire to get there for raw materials and markets. But two, they also have the ability because they have this new medicine, quinine. Another thing that's driving the Europeans into Africa um, is the white man's burden, right? The idea that white people have a responsibility to go spread their culture and religion to the quote-unquote lesser peoples of the world. And so we're going to see missionaries um, go into Africa to try to spread Christianity, mostly Protestant Christianity, but there is going to be some Catholic um, as well. So this all leads to what's called the scramble for Africa. As Europeans have this whole continent open up for them, um, it might have led to European wars as one European nation tries to get big chunks of Africa and so does another one and that might led, that competition might have led to war. And so to avoid that from happening, Europeans sat down I mean, Berlin in Germany and they had what's called the Berlin Conference from 1884 to 1885. And at the peace table, they carve up Africa. They say, this is mine, this is yours. Um, and so they take it. Of course, there aren't any Africans at the Berlin Conference, um, and so Africa is going to be divided up without the Africans themselves there. 
If we look at this map in the top right hand corner, we see this is a map showing the major ethnic tribes of Africa, and there's a lot. If you look down below though, in the bottom map, you see that the political boundaries that are being drawn by the Europeans in Berlin no, in no way match the ethnic boundaries. Now, if we fast forward a little bit to the 20th century, we will see that Africa is going, African countries are gonna get their independence um, after World War II. And when they get their independence, um, there's gonna be lots of ethnic cleansing and conflict going on in Africa because at the Berlin Conference, the boundaries that were drawn forced ethnic groups who hated each other to live together in one country, or they split up ethnic groups into two separate countries that wanna be reunited. And so this is going to be a problem that we're still dealing with today. Um, we see that there is ethnic violence still in Africa because the Europeans you know, drew their boundaries according to what they wanted and they didn't pay attention to ethnicity. So that's a long-term consequence of imperialism. Um, the last thing we see on this uh, before we move on is that, like I had said on the previous slide, everything on this map down below that is anything but yellow is going to be controlled by Europeans. The two exceptions are Ethiopia and Liberia. Liberia is going to stay independent because it really started out as a U.S. philanthropic colony um, in the early part of the 1800s the Americans created a um, charity that tried to, but this is before uh, the Civil War, that tried to free African slaves and bring them back to Africa in the, in the colony of Liberia, short for liberty. Um, it's not owned by the United States, but it's supported by these U.S. organizations. And so they're able to eat, keep their independence from Europe. The other one is Ethiopia. Ethiopia is going to successfully adopt uh, Western technology, they're going to modernize their military. And so when they are tried to take, when Italy actually tries to take over Ethiopia and have a colony, um, the Ethiopians are able to keep the Italians out because they adopted to Western technology. But those are the only two exceptions in this vast continent of people being able to keep their independence. So the rest of these, this section on Africa, we're going to do some case studies. So we don't have time to talk about every African country or region, but we'll talk about some, uh, some to give you some ideas of, uh, we can see some specific things in practice, and we also have some information you could use on an essay. So in the Congo, um, we see Congo here, it's this blue color, the Belgian Congo. So um, Belgium is controlled by a king, his name is King Leopold, and he's a very, he's the king of a very small country in Europe. And we see nationalism here. As he looks around, and all these European countries are getting really powerful. They're getting colonies, they're industrializing, their economies are growing. He doesn't want to be left out. He wants his country to be strong and powerful. And so he funds um, an army that, that works for him, and they go into Africa, and they take the Belgian Congo. Um, he does this in two ways. One, um, primarily he uses force. And so he uses modern weapons from his country. They, they use Belgian troops and they also hire mercenaries, the local African tribes, to work for them. And they go in and they forcefully take over parts of the Congo um, and put it under his direct rule. Um, other, other times they'll use treaties. Um, we can see an example on the very bottom. It says, we, we the undersigned chiefs of and this is an actual treaty that they just filled in the blank of the tribe. With the view of bettering our country and people, not really, do this day cede to the Royal Niger Company forever the whole of our territory extending from here to here, right? And so this is company rule again, but it's a company that's controlled by King Leopold. Now, the, so they're going to take over Africa either by force or with pressure through treaties. Um, of course, the purpose of this company, the Royal Niger Company, is to make money. That's the purpose of any company. And so they are going to be pretty ruthless in their treatment of Africans to um, make a profit. So they're going to forcefully employ Africans in mines and building roads and railroads, um, growing cash crops. Um, and so we're going to see starvation as people stop growing food and start working for the Royal Niger Company. We're also going to see that if people say, no, we're not going to do this, um, Leopold is going to order his troops and his company to make an uh, example of these people. And so they took machetes and cut off hands and feet to let everybody, put everybody on notice that if you go against the Royal Niger Company and the King Leopold, um, this is what's going to happen to you. Um, so it's pretty ruthless examples of imperialism in Africa. Now, eventually, the company creates so much anger 
um, and rebellion and mismanagement that eventually we see the Belgian government itself just take over the company away from King Leopold and the Royal Niger Company in 1908. So that's a little bit out of this time period that we're currently in, but it's close enough. Um, we see parallels with India, where the British East India Tea Company eventually mismanaged um, and created all kinds of havoc and starvation in India, and eventually the government of England took over. So something very similar here. Next we go to South Africa. Um, so again, we're going to go back to the early modern period. And just to kind of give you some background. So in the early modern period, during the age of exploration, the Dutch are actually going to come here and replace the Portuguese. And they're going to set up what's called a settler colony. Um, and they're going to have Dutch families go to South Africa, and they're going to open up farms and cattle ranches, um, and they're going to do all the things that, um, you know, you want the you want to do as a settler colony to make money. And so this is going to be, this is a category that we have in AP of settler colonies. Um, they're actually there not just to exploit, they are, but they're also going to send families and they're going to try to reestablish Dutch culture there. The Dutch that live in South Africa are called the Boers. Now a little bit later, we're going to see a wave of German immigration into South Africa looking for a better life. There's going to be some revolutions going on um, in Germany in the 1800s. Um, people are going to try to get out of Germany and go, um, like, you know, bring their families and, and make money. And so it's another example of settler colony. And these Dutch will intermingle and inter intermarry with the, uh, the Germans that are just arriving. And so they're going to be called Afrikaans. And as the European population increases um, through immigration and natural increase, we're going to see them move inland, which in this case means north, um, causing more conflict with the natives as they start to gobble up some of the Africans' land. Now, eventually, now we're into our time period, um, a little bit more. In the 19th century, we're going to see that the British come in and take over South Africa away from the Dutch. Um, and they're able to do this because of the Napoleonic Wars. So when Europe is in, in chaos and the continental Europe is weakened, the British are going to rise to power um, because they're not conquered by Napoleon. And they're able to come in and take over control of South Africa. And so now it's a British colony. And again, British will come and move as a settler colony. They're not there just to make money, but they're also there to um, bring families and set up new lives. So we're going to continue on with South Africa on this slide. So as more and more Europeans arrive, now it's a new wave of Europeans, it's the English, we're going to see that the, the Africans lose control of their land, um, and now they're working for, if they can find a job, they're working for the British or the Europeans, and they're going to get paid very little, um, and so it's going to create more poverty among Africans. And so then we have another example of native resistance, like we've talked about in other parts of this lecture. Um, and so native resistance, we have the Shosha cattle killing movement. And so it starts with this teenage girl, and she says that she has a vision that in order to get the Europeans out, um, all we need to do is trust in our ancestors and our gods. Um, and so she says that we, what we need to do is if we kill all of our cattle that we depend on to eat, um, that'll put us completely at the mercy of our gods and ancestors. And once we do that, um, then that'll prove to our gods and ancestors that we really believe in them and care about them and we'll put our lives in their hands and they'll, they'll take care of us and they'll kick the Europeans out. Um, and so people follow her beliefs um, and we see this mask, the, the, the Africans kill off their cattle crops. Um, because of what she said, and then the, so as a result, start mass starvation happens, and and her tribal population will drop from about one hundred five thousand to twenty seven thousand because of starvation, um, and so here we see another example of people returning to religion as a, a way to get rid of uh, invaders. In the Americas, we saw the, um, the white buffalo uh, movement or the ghost dance movement. Um, we also saw a religious component to rebellion in um, the Sepoy Mutiny. We also saw examples of this in China as well. Um, and so we're seeing this happen again and again around the world as their lives are being threatened. They turn to religion to kind of lead their rebellion. Another example of native resistance is the Zulu War, the Anglo-Zulu War. Anglo means English. So the Zulu were a tribe that was flourishing at this time just north of British South Africa. They were one, an example of one of these civilizations that is flourishing on the periphery of European powers. 
Um, one example in the United States was the Cherokee Indian Nation. We have talked about them. Um, and so we see the Zulu Nation is expanding south as the British are expanding north. And these two empires clash. And they fight a war in 1879, the Anglo-Zulu War. And as you can see in the picture, the Zulu are going to lose. There's a lot of them, the Zulu. They're very brave warriors, but they're going to attack the British with hide-covered shields and um, spears. And the British have modern industrial weapons, and so even though there's more Zulu than British, the British are able to win stunning victories um, because they just have superior weaponry. Um, and so there's an, another example of native resistance. Now, once the Zulu rebellion is put down, we see that the British are the unrivaled conquerors of southern Africa. And so um, we're going to continue to do what the Dutch and the Germans before in South Africa have done. They're going to force natives to work on cattle ranches owned by the British or farms, or they're going to force them to work in diamond mines, gold mines, which South Africa has a lot. Um, and so this is going to cause starvation. Um, and poverty, because no longer Africans independent, no longer they're growing their own food, and they've become what we call a dependent economy, and they depend on the British to buy it and to get, make them goods, and they depend on the British to give them jobs, and of course the British are going to pay them as little as possible. And so we see that Africans are at the bottom of the economic and social um, uh, pyramid. Now, with this increased demand for raw materials, um, we're going to see that Africa, because of the poverty and the starvation and the wars and the rebellions, we're going to see that there's a shortage of workers. And so from India, we're going to see um, thousands and thousands of immigrants come from India as indentured servants. And they're trying to escape their own poverty and starvation in India under British rule. Um, and they're going to just slide over to another British colony in South Africa. And they're going to work again at the bottom of the social structure um, as uh, people working in just alongside Africans um, in these mines and these ranches and the plantations and things like that. So here's an example of immigration in this world at the time. So let's go up to northern Africa, and it's Algeria. And um, from 1830 to 1962, the French will control northern Africa, or Algeria. Um, it starts as a French settler colony. So if you see on this map, in kind of the dark blue or purple-ish color, that's France. And just south across the Mediterranean is Algeria. Um, and so it's very close to France. And so we're going to see that the French start to move to North Africa, or Algeria. And they're going to bring their families with them. Um, it's actually going to be a part of France. It's going to be a, a state within the, in the country of France eventually, even though it's separated by the Mediterranean. They'll elect people to the French um, government. Um, and so we see that the French will move there. And it's another example of a settler colony. Now, what about the um, African majority that was already there? Well, just like we've seen all around the world, the French will use um, warfare um, and economic imperialism as well to subject the native population to European imperial rule. And so here's an example of a document that we see at this time. And so it says, all populations, this is a French um, military leader talking to his people, his soldiers, all populations who do not accept our conditions must be despoiled. In other words, killed. Everything must be seized, devastated, without age or sex distinction. Grass must not grow anymore where the French army has set foot. I personally warn all good soldiers whom I have the honor to lead that if they happen to bring me a living Arab, they will receive a beating with the flat of the saber. He wants, obviously, them to kill everybody. This is how, my dear friend, we must make war against Arabs. Kill all men over the age of 15, take all other women and children, load them onto naval vessels, and send them to the Marquise Islands or elsewhere to be used as um, labor. Um, in one word, annihilate all who will not crawl beneath our feet like dogs. And so this kind of captures the spirit of French imperialism in North Africa. They come in, they subject the native population through violence, um, and then they use them as labor, and then the French are in control of the, of the country. So that takes care of Africa. Obviously, we could go on and on about examples, but those are some uh, examples that you could use on an essay, like I had said. Then we're going to finish this lecture by talking about immigration. And this lecture, this uh, doesn't have to be just to and out of Africa. This is really talking about the whole world at this time. So throughout this unit, um, we have talked about immigration around the world. 
um, and what is causing these big migrations of people around the world? Well, there are push and pull factors when we talk about immigration. Push factors are things that are pushing people out of their home country, things that are bad that they want to escape. And so religious persecution, we've talked about pogroms, um, official persecutions of Jews in Russia, and so they'll leave to go to America or someplace else where they won't be killed. Um, we've talked about starvation as a push factor. We talked about in India, um, under British, um, the British East India Tea Company's rule, there was lots of starvation, and so to escape that, try to have a better life for your family and yourself, you will leave the country and go someplace else where they might have jobs, even if you're an indentured servant. And of course, oppression, right? If a European country is coming in to take over your colony and they're oppressing you and they're killing you, as we saw on the last slide, you want to get out of there. Um, and so people will move because of that. Now, another factor, not push, but this time pull. What is attracting people to a new place? And it's usually just the opposite of the push factor. So if you're leaving because of religious persecution, maybe you're going to go someplace where there's religious freedom, like Jews going to the United States, where there's more religious freedom. Um, jobs is a, the, the major pull factor at this point. People are from Europe are going to go to the United States because there's jobs in the United States because they're industrializing. Um, we're going to see people in India move to South Africa or the Caribbean for jobs as indentured servants. Um, and so these are the reasons that people traditionally have moved around the world and they're going to continue to move around the world for these reasons. So who are these immigrants? Typically, sometimes they come as families, but typically most immigrants are going to be young, male, single, and usually unskilled. The young male single part is because if you're young male and single, you don't have anything tying you down. You don't have anything that's keeping you from leaving. You're not married. You don't have to support a wife and kids. Um, you're young, so you're strong, and um, you can go do manual labor. Um, and so that's what the unskilled fit, fits in. If you have a skill, you're probably not leaving the country you're at because usually skilled laborers get paid more than unskilled laborers, and there's no reason to leave. But if you're unskilled, then you're not going to have a job or you're going to get paid very little. And so you're going to go someplace where hopefully they have more pay and better jobs. And so those are the times of people who tend to be immigrants. Now, once you get to the new country you're going to, you're going to live in what's called ethnic enclaves, um, sometimes called diasporic communities. And so when the Chinese move to get out of China from all its violence and and um, chaos that's going on in China that we've talked about. They'll go to like the United States and they'll go to San Francisco and they'll live in um, Chinatown. Um, it's this little um, neighborhood that has that everybody's Chinese and it's very familiar. Um, you can sell, you can speak your language, you can celebrate your holidays, you might know people there, and it makes being an immigrant a little bit more less scary and more supportive. We see Little Italy in New York. Um, we'll see um, South Asian communities in in the Caribbean or see South Asian communities inside of South Africa and people are living in those tight-knit communities where they can get some support in this new country. Of course, when we see immigration, we always see anti-immigration. As new groups of people move into a country, they're going to face racism and discrimination because the group that was already there is going to feel threatened. That, you know, maybe these immigrants are going to take our jobs or they're going to change our culture or maybe they're poor and so they bring poverty and crime. Um, and so we see all of these usual reasons for um, not liking immigrants and so we're going to see anti-immigration. Now we've talked about this before. Um, we've talked about the Chinese exclusion Act in 1882 as the United States wanted to stop Chinese coming in for the reasons we mentioned. And here's a new one. Um, we're going to see something in Australia, which is a British colony at this point, the white Australian policy. Um, and so that basically said the white uh, people who lived in Australia, who were descendants mostly from um, the UK, from England, um, they saw all these other people coming in that were different color skin and different religion and different um, look to them and they, they were afraid that they were going to be taken over and so we said that there no more um, South Asians coming in even though they wanted to get a job um, no more Southeast Asians no more Africans all of these people were coming into Australia because it was um, you know there were jobs there and there was religious freedom there um, and so here we see another race-based anti-immigrant um, policy that is created around the world um, so that concludes um, the Imperialism Lecture, Part 3, in fact, the, all of the Imperialism Lecture. Um, that also concludes um, Unit 3 of this class, Period 3, um, 1750 to 1900.